Good evening. Let's all stand together. And we will pray and worship the Lord tonight. Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you, Father, and we love coming together as a body of believers, of like-minded people that are in love with you and, and have given their lives to you. And so tonight we pray, Lord, that you would just pour your, yourself out on this place, pour your word out on this place and your spirit, and Lord, help us to enjoy every moment with you. God, I pray you teach us through your word. God, I pray you'd restore our soul and restore, uh, restore everything about us as we worship you and praise you and sit before you, God. And we thank you for your communion with you tonight. God, we pray that it would just be a sweet night uh, celebrating you and enjoying you tonight. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing your love, O oh Lord. Your love, O oh Lord, it reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Yeah, your justice flows like the ocean. Your love, oh Lord, it reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift my voice and I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your way. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your way. I lift my voice. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your way. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Praise the Lord. You can be seated if you'd like. The 
thousand times I failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all will above all else my purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out, the will above all else. You will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing my soul in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all. heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace, and to love you from the inside out, everlasting, your light will shine away. goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out of oh, my soul, and cries out. In my heart and my soul. Lord, I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace, and to love you from the inside out. Lord, I give you control and consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace and to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart is to bring You praise from the inside out Oh, my soul It cries out from the inside out Oh, my soul It cries out That the Lord of all the earth 
I care to know my name I care to feel my hurt Who am I Let the bright and morning star I choose to light the way For my ever watching heart Not because of who I am But because of what you've done not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling. And you've told me who I am I am yours Who am I? Let the eyes that see my sin Will look on me with love And watch me rise again Who am I? Let the voice that calm the sea Call out through the rain and calm the storm in me. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading. Here today and gone tomorrow A wave tossed in the ocean A vapor in the wind Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you told me who I am I am you Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling would you catch me when I'm falling you told me who I am I am yours I am yours I am yours let's all stand and sing this last song you like Yes. 
Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you tonight. Please be seated. And you can turn to Psalm 102. Psalm 102. Plan on covering two psalms tonight. Just blessed to be with you and enjoying God's Word, His mighty Word that changes us, transforms us by His Holy Spirit. Let me open in prayer and begin to enjoy this with you. So, Father, we just thank you and praise you for being a great and awesome and mighty and loving and caring God. And tonight as we study these two psalms, Lord, you have many things you want to encourage us with, exhort us with, challenge us. And we just want to submit to the fullness and the work of your Holy Spirit and just be blessed by it. So, Lord, we give you this evening. Thank you and praise you for your presence and love in our lives and all that you want to do tonight. So. We welcome you to do that work, Lord. Thank you. We praise you. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm 102. Please look at the uh, uh, introduction to this. It's a little bit of a longer introduction, if you will. It says, a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. So no author is attributed to this particular psalm, but it's a it's an important psalm uh, in our lives as we look at you know, we're going to go through times of affliction. That's just the way it is. That's just life. And Jesus did tell us that, you know, we will face tribulation. In fact, he said, uh, he said, in me, uh, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So we're going to face afflictions in life. And we know we can relate to this psalm in some way, maybe not the level of the affliction this particular man was experiencing, but we will experience afflictions in life. And so we want to learn from him. What is it that he does well? What doesn't he do? And one of the first lessons we want to see immediately is that he's afflicted and he's going to take his issues to the Lord. Now, look at this. It may sound negative, but I don't necessarily think it's negative. This introduction is when he is overwhelmed, that happens to us, and pours out his complaint. That's what may be seen as negative, complaint. We're to do all things without complaining, but that word complaint uh, is, is a fairly broad meaning, and it can just simply speak of just sharing your concerns, sharing your thoughts. It can mean uh, thoughts, and it uh, can mean um, kind of your anguish. And so sometimes you're just sharing your anguish with the Lord. You're not complaining while you're sharing these struggles. And so I'm going to, uh, grace hopes all things, love hopes all things. I'm assuming that's what this man is doing. He just wants to share his heart with the Lord. And so I think the Lord left this uh, authorless on purpose. 
Some speculate the situation that, that drove the writing of this psalm. I think that, in my opinion, I think many of the things written in, in Scripture, certainly in the psalms, the, the situation wasn't given on purpose. Because I think sometimes we can kind of pigeonhole that passage and say, that wouldn't apply to me in that situation because that's not my situation. But we can all be afflicted at times. And so we will go through trials. Now remember, we're supposed to uh, count it all joy when we face various trials. That is not my natural inclination. I don't know how many people are all excited and joyful when I have problems. Or when a family member is sick or, or something very serious happens or the car breaks down or I lose a job. I don't, the joy is not my first thought. But God wants us to grow to that. In James 1, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Here's why. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. Romans chapter 5 says, not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And it goes on to talk about other things. Both of the passages that very, very directly talk about how we're to look at trials tell us they produce things in our lives. That's where the joy is supposed to come, is in my spiritual growth and the maturity that's going to come out of the trial and teach me to depend on the Lord more. And so that's what we want to learn is how do we have that in the midst of this. Now, this psalmist is going to go right into his psalm. He's going to go right into five requests. He's not going to waste any time. And that, that is kind of interesting to me as well. When we think of the Lord's Prayer that he gave us, you know, he wants us to remember who we're praying to first. You know, we speak to, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name and these things. But sometimes you're just so in such anguish, you just got to start immediately praying and just asking things. And I don't think the Lord is upset at that at all. But let's look at the five requests this man immediately makes. Number one, hear my prayer, O Lord. Lord, would you hear me? Would you hear me? Now, God hears everything, and we know that. We have the blessing of knowing that, reading his word. But we can feel like at times, Lord, I need you to hear my prayer. I'm desperate for you to hear my prayer. Now, there are things that can hinder our prayers being heard by God. And it's not that he doesn't hear them. It's kind of a, a decision. It's like God saying, look, if you don't care about me as, a, as a, your father and don't want to have a relationship with me, why should I hear your prayers? I mean, we need to have a relationship. Isaiah 59 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So God might say, Look, I've offered you a relationship. You don't want it. Why should I hear your prayers? But why would I do that? You're still in your sins. I'm ready to forgive you. I'm ready to love you. Come to me and I'll hear your prayers. So we need to know that the number one thing for God to hear our prayer is to come into a relationship with him and he'll hear our prayers and he will listen to them. Next request he makes here is, and let my cry come to you. So it's a variation these are almost all variations of the first one here in this, these five. So he wants God to hear his prayer and then let my cry come to you. And of course, if we cry to God, we want it to get to him. We want him to hear it. We want him to listen. And we, want, we don't want a, a mediator, so to speak. We just want to go right to God. We want him to hear our prayer. Now, we do have a mediator in Jesus, and that is how we get to the Father. But we, he wants the Father to hear that cry and it to come to him. Thirdly, do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. It seems like an, kind of an odd f phrase, doesn't it? I mean, would anybody ever think God actually hides his face from us? Again, once we have a relationship with him, he's, his, his face is upon us. He loves us. He's saying, child, come to me. I want to hear from you. I love you. I, I want to shine my countenance upon you. I want to love you. I want to care for you. But we can almost think that God has hidden from us. Now, I do get a little bit that maybe somebody looked at a little more this way in the Old Covenant. Because remember, the Old Covenant, access to God was hard and extremely narrow. Only the high priest, only once a year, only after offering sacrifice. He had to do everything just right. It was only that one man a year in the whole nation of Israel. After all the proper sacrifices, this one proper way he could come to the God. And we come along in the New Covenant because of Jesus. And he ripped that veil in two acknowledging we have full and complete access to him. In fact, Hebrews 4 tells us to come boldly to his throne. We are in such a better place. And so we just want to come to him. He's not hiding from us. No matter what we're going through, no matter what trial, he is there for us. And so he does want to hear us, and he doesn't hide his face from us. Now, I am encouraged that even men, many men of the Old Testament experienced an, an incredible intimacy with God. 
I think about Moses. I mean, think about Moses coming into the, what was the presence of God there at the burning bush or then at the tabernacle. And the Bible talks about he talked to him as though face to face. Now, he didn't see him face to face, but he talked to him as though face to face, this on back and forth conversation. He had an amazing special relationship. Uh, we can think of David. So often we'd see David would said he would seek the Lord. Do I go to battle here, Lord? What do I do? And the Lord would not only sometimes tell him, go, yes, go to battle, but even tell him how to battle and how to engage the enemy so that he would win. And it can go on and on. Many of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Habakkuk, in, in that is one of the minor prophets, and he's not minor in any way, but as we know, we, we call him that, but is he was just anticipating to hear from God, so excited thinking God would speak to him. And so they did have that. And God wants us to have that same sense of anticipation in our trials, in our troubles, when we come to him. Now, the fourth one here, incline your ear to me, is interesting because it is a takeoff on the first one here, my prayer. But now there's an even greater active listening. It's one thing for somebody, to, for somebody to be in the room and hear your prayer. It's another thing for them to incline their ear to actually lean towards. The words incline your ear has a sense of somebody physically leaning closer as if to listen intently. We call that today active listening to really make a decision to listen carefully, incline your ear to me in the day that I call. And so that's what he's asking of the Lord. Would you not just hear, actually bend down to me in the day that I call, finally, in the day that I call, answer me speedily. Now I know we all want the Lord to answer our prayer right now, right? Not, not tomorrow, not a month from now. Yesterday would be good enough. Just answer my prayer. We want microwave answers. And sometimes we feel like the Lord's got a crock pot or something. He's just going to, it's going to be hours or weeks. And this is not the way it is. And God wants to produce that character. Sometimes the character wouldn't happen if we just, if he just gave us what we need right away. Now, he always does give us what we need. Don't get me wrong. But that answer to that prayer may be slow in coming. Sometimes the answer is yes, not yet. And we have to wait but we want him to answer us speedily. We always want that immediate answer. It just seems that's our flesh. That's what we want. We want the Lord to just remove any discomfort, any pain, any lack of faith. And he's in the faith business. That's what he wants more than anything from us is not our happiness, not our comfort, but our faith to grow. And sometimes that takes a slow answer for, to, for that to grow in our hearts and minds. And are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be patient and wait on the Lord? Now, there it is. You know this guy's going through some really hard stuff just from what we just read. And the look at I mean, what he said in verse 2, in the day of my trouble. I'm going through some seriously hard stuff. I need you to answer me, Lord. And I need an answer now. Help me. What he's going to do now, I think, in verses 3 to 11, is lay out the reasons why he feels he's in such dire straits. He's going to lay it out. Not extremely specific, again, but he's going to lay this out. And we're going to tell this by the words, I, me, and my. If you're the type that circles, I like to highlight with certain colors, but all the, all the recurrence of my, 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 and I, he has a lot of I's and my's in this verses 3 to 11. And so he's just laying out his case before the Lord. Lord, this is why I need you to hear me. No, the Lord knows everything. But I think he's pleased when we lay our hearts before him, even though he already knows everything. He wants this to be an ongoing, growing, healthy relationship. Talk to him. Know that he's listening. And so notice verse 3 begins with the word for. That's a reason word. He's linking what he just said. I've asked these things of you. Here's why, Lord. For my days are consumed like smoke. I don't know if you've ever been through a trial that's so hard you feel like you're being consumed, the days are consumed like smoke. But you think about what smoke does, right? Smoke comes up from a fire and it just dissipates. It's just like it's just gone. And this guy is going, whatever he's going through, it is so tough. It's just like smoke. It's just rising up and disappearing. And just his life's just dissipating. It's just so hard. I'm just trying to survive. There's almost a sense of no substance to what I'm going through. It's just tough. It's like smoke that's just wafting away. Next description he gives is, my bones are burned like a hearth. And I think we've maybe all experienced something like that where sometimes you've been through a trial so hard that almost you can feel your innards are burning. You're just, you're just aching. It's just so hard. If there's any way I can get beyond this and stop burning inside, 
It's just eating me up, we might say something like that. But his, his bones are burned like a hearth. And if you ever got on a hearth at a fireplace when a fire's been going a long time, you almost can't sit on it. It just can be so hot. And that's what he is feeling. He goes on, his, his next description, my heart is stricken and withered like grass. So our heart speaks, in many ways, it's a, it's a broad word, of course, used of our kind of our emotions and our thought process. And my heart's it's stricken, and I feel like withered grass. Grass that's been cut, it's just, it's, or may not have been cut, it's just it's withered because of lack of moisture, water, whatever, and it's just, it's just withering away. His heart is withering. It's almost like he's saying, I have no hope anymore. I'm losing my hope. And Lord, I need you to jump in here. I need you to help me. He's so distressed, notice what he says then in verse 4, his heart is so stricken that I forget to eat my bread. Now, how hard do things have to get to not eat? Have you ever actually had something so bad? I know I have, where you literally feel you can't eat. I mean, I'm so worried, upset, whatever, about a situation that's occurred, I can't even eat. I, I, I can't take any food in. My, whatever my stomach, there's just something that's so bothering me, I have no appetite whatsoever. And so he just feels that way. And he just, oh, I just can't take it anymore. I forgot to eat my bread. Why? Because of the sound of my groaning. And so it just goes on and on. And you're beginning to get a feel. You kind of wish, man, I wish I knew what he was going through. But whatever it is, it is extremely serious. And again, we, could all, we all may go through something at some point in our life like this. The next thing he says here, because of the, of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. Now, it's an interesting combination, not to say they were meant to tie together. When a guy forgets to eat, the trial's so hard, it's like he's wasting away. And if he isn't eating, it's almost a picture that he almost feels like he's physically emaciating here with his bones clinging to his skin. And we could go through trials like that, where we feel like that. And maybe, it's, maybe it's more a... Maybe it was intended to be a spiritual sense of, of, of thirst and hunger. But uh, we can kind of get the sense of what he's struggling with. He goes on to say, I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I lie awake. And I'm like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Now, interesting words to use. And sometimes we can wonder. And I don't know exactly why he picked these particular birds. Although these birds, the pelican and the owl, are used in some passages that are kind of very... A downer passages, kind of depressing. For example, in Isaiah 34, kind of in a dark place, it says, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its streams shall be turned into pitch and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever, but the pelican and the porcupine shall possess it, and the owl and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out over it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. It's this kind of barren, deserted, horrible place, and that's where these animals are dwelling. And it's a confusion. And that's, I think, how this man feels in, as he is in this place. I think he's feeling extremely lonely. He even specifically mentions this sparrow being alone on the housetop. He didn't say, I'm in the housetop with friends. I'm alone. Now, I don't necessarily think it was him at all, but I think if you think of Job, you can easily put him in this psalm. Easily. What he went through, what he struggled with, just being consumed in everything that he's going through. His friends had turned on him. He's going to start talking about things like that and the enemies but uh, you can just begin to at least get a sense of somebody that could have felt this way. And he goes on, verse 8, My enemies reproach me all day long. Now with poor Job, I think by the time things got done, he didn't think he had a single friend. I think he thought everybody was his enemy. <clears throat> you know, the old line, with friends like you who needs enemies, as his friends turned on him, and they were wrong. Their assessment of him, we know, was completely wrong. They accused him of sin, some hidden sin, they were wrong. We know God's commending of him, and he must have felt all alone. Again, I'm just using him as one example because I do believe the Lord wants to, pro to apply very broadly into our lives. But my enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. <clears throat> and so sometimes we can feel like I'm doing everything I can, and I just feel like I've just been totally, completely abandoned. I just feel totally abandoned. <clears throat> 
Verse 9, for I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Now, <clears throat> ashes are a picture of mourning in Scripture. In the Old Testament, there are a couple of things that very consistently represent mourning. Sometimes they would put on sackcloth. It's very scratchy kind of a material when they were in mourning. And then sometimes they would sit in ashes. Sometimes even throw the ashes over their head. I think that's the imagery here. It's like he threw it up and he's holding bread. The ashes land on it. He's going to eat it. Like, this is just my lot right now. This is just what I'm going through. In fact, in Job 2, we read of Job. He took for himself a pot shirt with which to scrape himself. How bad it, How bad's life when you're scraping yourself with a chunk of broken pottery? And while he sat in the midst of ashes. So he sat like that in the middle of the ashes. And so this guy says, I'm eating ashes like bread. A minute ago, I couldn't eat anything, but what I'm eating is ashes. It's just all morning. It's just terrible and mingled my drink with weeping. I'm weeping over everything. And then notice what he says here, interesting in verse 10, because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me away. Now it's interesting to me, and it's almost, it's kind of a weird, you don't look at this and go, okay, is this supposed to be positive or negative? I mean, is he blaming God for what he's going through? I mean, in a way, because he's sovereign, you could say that, but also the Lord does allow trials in our lives to grow the maturity that's needed in that way, we could kind of blame him, but the Lord also promised never to give us more than we can handle. So we don't want to blame him for anything. In fact, the Lord wants us to have that joy. But he does believe, notice the your is capitalized. We, we believe he's speaking to the Lord. He believes the Lord's indignation and the Lord's wrath. And I do love one distinction. I do believe that uh, for children, God only talks about his wrath being poured out on his enemies, not his children. It's reserved for them. And I praise the Lord, as children of God, his wrath is not for us. It's for the world. It's one of the reasons I believe that the church will be raptured out of here before his wrath during the seven-year great tribulation period. So anyway, he somehow thinks God has done this. But what's great, and what tells me his mind is at least somewhat right, he's praying to God in the middle of this trial. See, the problem is when we somehow get in the middle of a trial, we blame God for it, and then we start getting angry and turn from him. That's the tragedy. The one who can get us through it, the one who can sustain us, the one who can give us the power and joy in the midst of a trial to turn from him, that's the utter foolishness. Because the one place we can have joy going through a hard trial. So he says, you've lifted me up and cast me away. Now, God had not done that. It could be he just was saying it, he felt like it, but it's not true. And if you're a child of God, no matter what you're going through, he has not cast you away. He's not. He's not. He loves you. So he says, my days are like a shadow that lengthens. That's an interesting description. A shadow that lengthens, lengthens as the sun goes down. As it's late in the day. It's almost a picture of this is about, maybe my life is about to end. It's near the end. It's, it's becoming darkness soon, and I wither away like the grass. So he just, uh, just again, pouring his heart out. Just, I believe, heartbroken here before the Lord. But you, O oh Lord, I'm glad he changed his course here in verse 12, and he's going to begin to speak of the Lord's faithfulness. So even though he may have gotten a little haywire, as we may, about God's indignation, God's wrath, he's, he's going to trust the Lord. And, and this is where this psalm, to me, is worth so much. No matter what we're going through in a trial, we can read this man, read what he wrote, and remember, no matter what I'm going through, you're faithful. And you're going to be faithful again in the midst of this trial. I can trust you. So I love that he says, but. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever. In contrast to his feeling like the grass that's withered and the mess that I'm in and I feel like I'm just wasting away, you shall endure forever. The remembrance of your name to all generations. Lord, you are faithful. You're going to live forever. Your name representing you and your faithfulness will endure forever. On top of that, you will arise and have mercy on Zion. Now, this does tell me that some do believe that this psalm was written about maybe a time after they were taken into captivity because they got taken away from Zion, got taken away from Jerusalem. It is very possible. So some think it's some of the children of Israel in Babylon, like Daniel, and going through those trials. But even there, God was faithful. And he did pour out some of his indignation on his people in taking them into captivity. And so if that, that some stuff even begins to make sense to what he said in verse 10 here. But you will arise. And notice what he says about Zion or Jerusalem. For the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. 
for your servants shall take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. And I think he's speaking about uh, Jerusalem through this whole thing, verses 13 and 14. Whether you talk about the stones in Jerusalem, the dust in Jerusalem, to some conquering, if, if you look at like Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians coming in, they conquer Jerusalem as just another dirty city with stones and dust. Just another city. But it's this very special city to the people of, of Israel. A very special city to God. And so God will show his favor upon them. And God still loves Israel. He still loves Jerusalem. It is the capital of Israel uh, because God's given it to them. And so here uh, he says, your servants do take pleasure in it. I love the imagery. Verse 15, so the nation shall fear the name of the Lord. And one day they will. And I think there's a bit of a hint here, maybe a prophetic hint, that yeah, one day the Lord will show favor. The greatest favor that's going to come upon Jerusalem is Jesus' second coming. They could have looked forward here to the first coming to come to Jerusalem to die for our sins, but then he's also going to come back to reign there. Oh, I can't wait for that day to see Jesus reigning and ruling in Jerusalem. All the kings of, uh, let me read the line before it leading up to that. So we get it. So the nation shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. That will happen when Jesus reigns. Everybody will see his glory. Oh, I just get so excited just the thought of that. For the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. So very clearly, some prophetic utterances about him coming. And of course, I do believe you could apply it to either his first or second coming. He did reveal his glory. They didn't see it. It'll be very obvious at his second coming. He was, is not in any way veiling who he is. I don't think he veiled himself in his first coming. He regularly said who he was. He regularly proclaimed himself to be God. Even though some people try to lie that Jesus didn't say that. He said he was God many times. But he will appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. So very exciting here. And it's as though this psalmist needs to remember God reigns. He's in control. He's going to take care of business. I can trust him. And then he says here, and I think it's one of the keys to this psalm is verse 18. This will be written for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. What's one of the reasons we record things in life? Why we keep journals? Why people wrote scripture? Why God calls for older women to teach and guide the younger women? Why there's supposed to be such reverence for older people and their wisdom to teach the next generation? And it's so important that gets passed on to the next generation. Of course, in Deuteronomy 6, the Lord commanded dads to pass on wherever you go and when you walk by the wayside, when you're in the house, when you're here and you're there, teach your children. So it's written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Now, you notice the word Lord. The word Lord appears here several times. It's notice all letters are capital, L-O-R-D, verse 16 Verse 18, verse 19, verse 21, verse 22. This is a psalm written to Jehovah, Lord, or Yahweh. He has looked down from the height of his sanctuary. Yes, he has. I think the picture of the sanctuary in heaven. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth. And why does God look down? Many other reasons. But I see at least three or four reasons here with the word to at the beginning of verse 20. Number one, to hear the groaning of the prisoner. God cares about us. He cares about the person that's in bondage whether it's physical bondage or much more importantly, spiritual bondage. That's why Jesus was sent to the earth to pay the penalty to get us out of the bondage of sin, to release those appointed to death. I like these two, right? He released us from the prison of sin and he released us from death. And that's the two things he did. He died on the cross to pay for our sins and he rose to prove he has power over death and can offer us life, to release us. You know, every single one of us was appointed to death. Every single one of us until we put our faith in Jesus and God gave us spiritual life. On top of that, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion. Now that makes perfect sense. Once a person realizes what God has done for them, he's forgiven their sins and given them life, we're to all declare how great he is. Declare his name in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. And when his people are gathered together and the kingdoms serve the Lord. So all this is gonna happen. This is all coming in the future. What a great glorious picture of the future. Uh, that this is all coming. So I just, again, I don't know about you, but I just get thoroughly excited when I look at our future and look at what's coming and that our God is reigning and he's going to put himself on the throne and make it clear 
He is, in fact, King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 23, as he begins to wrap up this psalm, he, he weakened my strength in the way. Now, I don't know what you think of that verse, that line. It's very interesting to me. He weakened my strength in the way he shortened my days. But why would the Lord weaken me? I think it's very simple. Man is, thinks too much of himself. If, if we think we can do anything apart from the Lord, it's foolishness. And when we begin to realize, when the Lord lets us go through trials like this, one of the benefits of trials, even though we may not like them, is that greater dependence. And, and when I look at that, I think of the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest pictures of the blessing of being weak and God weakening us and realizes, I can't do this, I need to trust in him, is given in 2 Corinthians 12. And if you remember, Paul had been given great visions of heaven, and then I think he knew he would be, run the risk of being prideful, and so the Lord afflicted him. And here's what we read in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So the Lord afflicted him on purpose to weaken him. And Paul gets it. He said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And when he helps us to be weak, if we realize it, that means I can depend on him more. And that's only when I'm really strong. And so he goes on to say, therefore, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's why God may allow us to go through trials to weaken our strength. Because a person that says, I can do this without the Lord, no, that needs to be broken out of us. We need to be totally dependent. And that's why he might weaken us or shorten our days to wake us up. I said, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. And as he closes here, verses 25 to 27, I'm gonna read those in a chunk because they're very special verses because what he does here is right before he closes is he remembers God, you're the creator of the universe. You're the one I'm coming to, not just some guy that might help me in a bind. You're the creator of the universe. You can fix anything at any moment. You can fix my entire situation just by saying the word. And so notice what he says. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. You're the almighty creator of the universe, unchanging. You love me, you've always loved me, and that'll never change. And he also throws in there, yeah, you know, things are gonna grow old, perish. The Lord did subject the world to futility and, and, and decay because of sin, to give us a word picture. But these three verses are very, very important to me, and uh, you probably know why, but these three verses are repeated verbatim in Hebrews chapter one. And the Father quotes them to Jesus. And what's so amazing to me, um, I'll just tell you, one of the reasons I really love this psalm is, um, I don't know how you react when people come to your door trying to sell you a lie. And, and I don't mean to put them down in any way, but when Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, this is the psalm I always ask them to read. I don't like to argue with them, so I just say, yeah, will you help me understand some of you? Please read Psalm 102 to me. And I let them read in their own Bible, and they read it. And I want you to notice here, verse 1, verse 12, and then have the words Lord in there, all L-O-R-D. Then verse 16, verse 18, verse 19, verse 21, verse 22. In their Bible, they translated it Jehovah. So I have them read it. And they get down to the end, and when they get to about verse 25, they say, who is this psalm written to? And they'll tell you it's written to Jehovah. Great. And then they read verses 25 to 27. And then I asked them, would you please turn to Hebrews chapter 1 and read verses 10 to 12. And it's the exact quote of these three verses. And the Father quotes it to Jesus. And when they read it, just simply ask, why did the Father call Jesus Jehovah? Why is he Jehovah God? Because he is. He's Jehovah God. He's the creator of the universe. And I just love that passage. I love this. It's a beautiful psalm. We're in the middle of whatever trial we're going, we can remember Jesus is the creator of the universe. He loves us. 
and he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We can always trust in him. He can overcome anything we deal with in our lives. And so there you go. Usually the only other thing at that point I like to share is John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's the I am word that was used at the burning bush. Jesus says, I'm him. I'm almighty Jehovah God. And you'll die in your sins if you don't believe that he is who he says he is. And I don't want you to do that. God loves you too much. Then he ends the psalm here. The children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. And so beautiful. I love how he ends kind of an upbeat tone. The children of your servants will continue. Their dwelling will be established before you. Praise the Lord. He's not done with Israel. They will live on. So will others into the millennial kingdom. So we will all have trials in life. But let's learn from this psalmist. Bring all those trials to him. Remember his faithfulness. Remember he will reign. He never stopped reigning. He can take care of us. And no matter how difficult our trial, he can take care of us as the creator of the universe. Just absolutely love this psalm. One of my favorites. Then Psalm 103 is very upbeat. I love it. This, I call this the bless, bless the Lord psalm. Please notice the verse. Well, first off, let's notice it's written by David. In fact, it's interesting. The header is a psalm of David. You may notice the words a psalm are in italics. They're not in the original language. Literally, the heading is of David. That's the whole heading. I think the, I think the translators added it for clarity. I think it's fair add. But it literally, the heading just says of David. David wrote this, and he's calling on us. I see this psalm as a tremendous exhortation to any believer in the Lord. And sometimes we just need a guy that has a gift of exhortation to come along and give us a little boost. Maybe a little hard boost. You see, if you ever met someone with a gift of exhortation, they have a way of just really, really letting you have it lovingly. It's like... Thanks for beating me up. Appreciate it. Gift of exhortation. It is a gift. It's a gift from the Lord. It's one of the reasons we need to gather together as a church because sometimes if you're feeling bad, you need somebody to say, you know, stop doing that. You're a child of the king. Why are you acting so depressed? Let's lift your head up. And so that gift, the gift of exhortation, the ability to console, to invite, to encourage, all these things. Well, notice what David does. It's very clear the key point of this psalm because I want you to just read the first two verses and the last three verses. Notice it begins, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now verse 20. Bless the Lord, O you angels. Verse 21. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts. Verse 22. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is a strong exhortation from David to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank him. Praise him. Thank him. Tell him how great he is. That's what we're called here to do. And, and if we just stop taking God for granted, we'll be excited about him, excited about his word. We'll be excited to bless him. So with that, let's look at what he tells us. He begins with, bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, do you ever talk to yourself? Don't do it in public, as you might think something wrong with you but bless the lord oh my soul he's talking to himself oh my soul what's your soul remember we're made up of three things body soul and spirit so your body you know what your body is your physical body i call that our hardware so if you're computer language that's the hardware your soul is your software your emotional makeup the heart the way you think your emotional makeup and the thought process that's your soul. So he's basically talking to himself and telling himself, bless the Lord. Of course, there's the spirit too. That's the thing that was dead until the Holy Spirit came to live in us. And we're only alive because his spirit's living in us. But sometimes we need to talk to ourselves and we can sometimes get depressed. We need to tell ourselves, hey, let's go here. Now, it's not the old pick yourself up by your bootstraps. It's the bless the Lord, oh my soul. It's because of who he is why why I can be upbeat and be encouraged today. Let's bless the Lord. Let's thank him. Let's praise him. Let's salute him. Oh, and by the way, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. He's basically saying, with every fiber of your being, bless the Lord. Don't hold anything back. Give it all to him. Give it all. Take your body, take your soul, 
take everything. It kind of reminds me of uh, Jesus in the New Testament, of course, when the scribes came to him, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving he had answered them, well asked, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus said, the first of all commandments is, hear, the, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what he's saying here. All that is within me, everything you have, bless the Lord. He deserves it. And, and I love the exhortation. I think we need it tonight. Thank you, Lord, through David to challenge me to bless the Lord. On top of that, don't just bless him, bless his holy name. That represents every aspect of him. His nature, his character, his forgiveness. In fact, he's gonna get into that in a minute. Because you, you may sit here tonight and go, okay, I'm gonna bless him. What's there to bless? Why, why, why sh should I be so thankful? He's gonna give us several reasons in verse three and through five. But let's look at what he says. He repeats himself, bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, as David talked to himself, he's repeating himself to himself, and sometimes we need it. Anybody that's parented before knows sometimes you have to repeat yourself. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, when you, I don't know if you've ever taken a, a particular subject in Scripture and said, I'm going to study everywhere that occurs. I think oftentimes we're shocked how many times the Lord talks about the same thing. And the Lord knows we need to be reminded. And the beauty of reading through the scriptures, let's say if you do it each year, you'll be surprised how often you keep coming back to repetitive themes because we need to be reminded. And so David tells himself, bless the Lord, O my soul, he comes back to it in verse two. Oh, by the way, and forget not his benefits. How good are you at forgetting his benefits? I think we're really good at that, really good at taking him for granted. I wake up one day and it's having a rough day and I forget how blessed I am. I forget I'm forgiven. I forget I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. I'm a co-heir with Christ. Oh my goodness. I've got so much going for me. Okay, so for the person who go, okay, I want to be faithful here to David. I want to not forget his benefits. I want to not forget, for example, the Passover in Egypt. David gave many things to remember to, so that people wouldn't forget. The Passover he instituted, that was to be an annual feast for the Jewish people so they would never forget. Or you think of the stones when they crossed through the Jordan with Joshua in Joshua chapter 4. They were to take those stones out as a memorial for them and their children. We have communion in the New Testament so that we don't forget. We're going to have communion tonight to remember God. We need to not forget his benefits. But what is it we need to not forget? Well, here we go. And by the way, the key word is the word who in verses 3 to 5. He's going to give us five reasons to bless the Lord and forget not his benefits. And so, why bless the Lord, number one, who forgives all your iniquities? Forgives them all. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad he didn't come to you one day and said, Jesus died for 99% of your sins? Oh, well, I'm not going to heaven because the other 1% is enough. Only takes one. Not good enough. He forgives all your all your iniquities. I'm just so grateful. That's the beginning. We come to God because we're sinners and we need forgiveness. That's the, the place we come to him is as sinners. Secondly, who heals all your diseases. Now you may read that and go, whoa, wait a second. I've got a family member just died. He didn't heal them. I would argue, I would argue about that. If they know the Lord, oh, they were healed. Healed better than you can imagine. They're getting a brand new body. That ratty old thing they were lugging around, that's gone. Let it rot. He's getting a new body, he or she, that's going to last for eternity. He healed them. He healed them. Sometimes, I don't know about you, I feel sorry for Lazarus got raised from the dead. <laughs> if I were to die, do not pray for me to come back. Do not. I'll be angry if I come back. I'll have to deal with that. And it's like, do you think he ever went into his sisters? And, Why did you ask him? And he, I was really thrilled in Abraham's bosom and I was waiting for Jesus soon to die and come and free me. I mean, it was just amazing. And you brought me back to this terrible place, earth. Come on. So anyway, he can heal anything, anything. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. We can trust him. He moves on. Now he says he forgive all, all iniquities. Now he says he heal all diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. Were we not on the path to destruction? 
every single one of us was on that path and God came by his Holy Spirit and said, you're a sinner, I love you, I wanna forgive you, I will give you life, complete forgiveness, eternal life, joy, all the gifts of my Holy Spirit, I redeemed you from destruction. Thank you, God. Have we forgotten tonight? It's just good to ask. Have I forgotten what he's done for me? He redeemed me from that. And the word redeem means to buy back. It's to pay a price to redeem somebody from something. The great picture in the Old Testament was if a person sold themselves into slavery, a family member could come buy them out. They would be the redeemer. And if it was a family member, they're a kinsman. They're a kinsman redeemer. And that's why Jesus had to become a man to become our kinsman redeemer, to die to pay for our sins, redeem us from a life of destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. We only have a savior because of his kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things. Isn't it, it's, it's, it's a legitimate question to ask tonight. Are you, are you satisfied with your life? And I would say the only true satisfaction in life, it's only found in him. There's no job, there's no home, there's no car, there's no retirement account that will satisfy. And when I look, and it breaks my heart, when I see so many famous people fabulously wealthy kill themselves because I think they thought the next thing was going to satisfy and the next thing was going to satisfy and they get to the pinnacle and they're totally unsatisfied because they've never quenched that spiritual thirst that's only fulfilled in Christ and that river of living water that he gives. He's the only one that satisfies where you can just sit at home. You could be dirt poor and be totally satisfied. By the way, you're never poor. If you're a child of God, you're fabulously wealthy. You just don't see it in, in the physical realm. But he satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Interesting description. I mean, we don't see eagles much. I do like the way they just seem to fly like as effortlessly. So they just open up their wings and just float on the wind. Just the beautiful picture of just, just strength and youth and all that. And anyway, he's just going to go on and on. And, and I call this a round one because he said, who, who does this, who does that, who does that? I'm going to say round two, verses six to 19. He's just going to go, continue to go on about things God has done for us. And so next I'll say, why to bless the Lord, number six? Because the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He will set everything straight one day. Everybody that's been oppressed, sometimes we, can get, we get so upset at injustice, God will fix that. We can trust him to take care of that. He has made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Now, if you're a child of God, if you're, if you're a, an Israelite in that day, you should be thanking the Lord for Moses. The law of Moses was there to bless you, to help you realize you're a sinner and in need of a savior. That's what the law is there for, to point out your sin, point out you deserve to die for your sin, and through the sacrifices, point you to Jesus. That is a tremendous blessing why the law of Moses was given. And so you can thank God and not forget his benefits of giving his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. And so every time you took an animal and sacrificed it, oh yeah, Messiah's coming. Thank you. He's coming. And I'd be thrilled thinking, can he come quick so I can keep, quit killing all these animals and blood everywhere? Thank you for that. He goes on to the eighth description, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. That's a great verse to memorize. He is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. All of that's true. He's merciful He's gracious. When we make mistakes, he's very slow with us. He doesn't like the parent that's a hothead and just jump all over us. And he's abounding in mercy. Verse 9, he will not strive with us. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Now that seems like a negative, doesn't it? But I think what the Lord's saying is, this is my opinion of this verse, I will deal with wickedness. I'm going to deal with it. Trust me. And that part of us that wants the justice that we mentioned earlier, verse 6. Yeah, you won't strive with us. One day you will do away with all flesh. We'll all be in heaven, those who put our faith in you. And so he won't keep his anger forever. He is, he is storing up wrath, and he will pour it out. But praise the Lord for those who love him. By, I think by contrast to verse 9, he's not dwelt with us according to our sins. Now, I think one thing we can all say, thank God you've not dealt with me according to my sin. Because I wouldn't be alive this moment if he did that, nor punished us according to our iniquities. 
And then he's just going to kind of almost, almost kind of get, ex- get lost in excitement for the Lord here. I love what he does here for the next few verses. Is he going to talk about, man, I am so weak and frail. You're the forgiving one. You're the amazing, loving one. I want to talk about how great you are. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. So he talked about his mercy in verse 8, but now he just wants to stop for a minute and describe how great his mercy is. It's great to do that sometimes. How great is his mercy. Notice who gets God's mercy. Only those who fear him. As much as God wants the whole world saved, not everybody fears him, not everybody will. And then one of my favorite, most favorite verses in the entire Bible, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I think, what's the big deal? He removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, I've I've said it before, but aren't you glad he didn't say he removed your sins as far as the north from the south? And let me demonstrate that, right? If you get in a plane and you fly north and you cross the North Pole, then you're going south. North can end. But if you fly east, there's no pole. You can fly east forever. And if you separated the sins as far as the east is from the west in our thinking, that means I'll never, ever come into contact with my sin ever again. It's that far separated. It's eternity-wise separated. Either way you look at it. So as far as the east is from the west, he's removed my sin. As a father pities his children, so the Lord. You notice these as and so. I don't know if you noticed verse 7. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's mercy. Verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed your sins. This little play on words. Verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those there it is again, who fear him. So he uses the phrase, those who fear him in verse 11, verse 13, and verse 17. It's a beautiful phrase. Only those people get that. Now, why is God so merciful, so loving, so pitying towards us? Verse 14 says, for, because he knows our frame. He knows how weak you are. He knows how frail and how almost naturally inclined towards sin we are. And he remembers that we are dust. So we're made up of the same elements of the dirt, That's just the way it is, and uh, we need to know that. And one day, from dust to dust, we will return to that. That's just the way it is. He goes on, as for man, his days are like grass. They are. It's funny, when you're you're younger, you think, I'll never get old, right? And then you get old and go, what happened? What happened? My goodness. I can't remember what happened, but it happened. Here I am. And uh, they just they just zip by. I mean, just man, I remember the guy that led me to the Lord. Praise God, his name was Steve. Love him to death. And you know, when I got saved, he was 33. I thought he was so old. So <laughs> I'm in my 33rd year of marriage. So I'm not. I'm way past 33 years old. It's just amazing how fast it goes. His days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. His place remembers it no more, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Thank God. Again, who's it limited to? On those who fear him. So not only did David say why we should bless the Lord, he gave all these benefits, but it's only to those who fear him. But once we fear him, all these benefits are fully ours. Of course we should be blessing the Lord and thanking him and praising him. So he goes on then to say, Again, let me read verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. His righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant. That's who it's to. Uh, That's not to say we're perfect as believers in the Lord. But we at least have the desire, the will, and the power to do of his good pleasure. And to those who remember his covenant to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That's enough to be thankful for. One day, perfect justice, a perfect ruling king. So after laying out all of these amazing blessings of God, how great he is, how great his mercy is, his forgiveness, his pity towards us, how he loves us, he goes back to the whole point of the psalm, bless the Lord. Now, isn't this interesting? Notice who he calls to bless him in verse 20. You, his angels. Well, that's interesting. Not all angels have done that. Sadly, we believe about a third of the angels fell for the lie. And, and it is my opinion the reason Satan fell 
and I just happen to be my belief, but I believe that because of what we're told in Job, late in Job, that when all of the angels saw God's creation, it says all the sons of God shouted for glory, and he, when he saw man and saw man worshiping God, that's when Satan got jealous. Before then, it's like, what's there to be jealous of? God's amazing. Now this man's worshiping him. He wanted that worship. And so he sinned and wanted to be like God and then wanted to convince mankind to worship him. And so, bless the Lord, you angels. It's too bad that Satan fell for that. But God intended them to, at least two-thirds of them, we believe, have been faithful to the Lord, who excel in strength. Now, we read earlier about being weakened in strength in the prior psalm. God made angels amazingly strong. Not as strong as the Lord. They're nothing compared to the Lord, but they have amazing strength. They do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Of course, we know that angels are here to minister to us. They're ministering angels. They're here to minister to us as God's children. But anyway, he calls on them to bless the Lord. By the way, in heaven, there's angels all over the place worshiping him. We're going to get to worship with angels. I can't wait for that. And bless the Lord, you, his hosts. And so that's speaking of the armies of the Lord. That's likely speaking of the angels as well. But remember, we're going to come back with Jesus to reign on the earth. And I think we'll become effectively a part of his host as well as the angels. You, who, uh, you ministers of his who do his pleasure, that's what we're here to do, his pleasure, if we remember what he's done for us. Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. And he finishes with, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Just amazing encouragement. So you look at this tonight, two great psalms. I think if you're in the middle of a trial, a great affliction, you can make a note. I can go back to Psalm 102. I can look to the Lord and be encouraged to get my eyes back upon the Lord. He's the creator of the universe. He can do all things. Or if you're just a little depressed or you're like feeling a little self-centered and maybe you're forgetting the greatness of who God is and you need to pick me up and let's bless the Lord, look at the list of blessings that David wonderfully laid out for us of what God's done for us and how great his mercy and forgiveness is and that we are called to bless the Lord. So as Christians, we're commanded to bless the Lord. Praise him. The word bless means praise or to salute or to give respect to, bless the Lord, and we're to talk to ourselves if we need to, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and go back to this psalm and be encouraged by it. So anyway, praise the Lord. Let me close in prayer. We'll open up for a few questions and get to celebrate communion tonight. So, oh, oh Lord, we just thank you for your astonishing gifts in our lives. Lord, I think of this psalm tonight. You've forgiven us, you've healed us, you've redeemed us, you've crowned us, you satisfied us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. You deserve our praise. You deserve our salute to you, our adoration. You are astonishingly good. And we can't wait to see you in heaven in all of your glory and then marvel for eternity at the fullness of your greatness. So thank you for that tonight. Lord, if anybody's been going through a great trial lately, would you just encourage them and just bless them and lift them up and remind them how good you are. Remind them of all that you've done for them and one day this life will be over forevermore. Peace and joy in your presence forever and ever. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to bless you for, and so much to not forget. So thank you for being so good. We thank you and praise you tonight, Lord. We ask all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We have a few minutes for questions, if we have any. I should have passed out the coffee a little earlier, a little coffee break and milk. Yeah, you got some questions somewhere. Yeah, great. Uh, first John 1, yes. Mm -hmm. And we read in Psalm 103 that God separates us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. Mm -hmm. And the thought being is that um, when we become a Christian, God forgave all of our sins past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a good question. If you guys want to turn there, please let me, I'm going to share another verse in in First John that helps clarify that. Um, 
so the issue is, first off, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've heard that. That's a, a belief by some groups uh, within Christianity that once you're forgiven, you don't need to confess your sin anymore because it's all forgiven. Uh, there's a couple of problems with that. Number one, this verse, verse this word if means since. Uh, this verse assumes we're confessing our sins as Christians. There's an if that's very certain that like you're going to do it since you do it, not if like if you will do it. This assumes we will do it. Um, I call this First uh, John the great litmus test. This whole book is about if we say one thing and do another, and God assumes as Christians we're doing this. We're confessing our sins to him. We're not thinking we're sinless. Um, now, I think the main argument of people that believe that, though, oh, by the way, one other thing in that verse, there's not just forgiveness that occurs, there's a cleansing that occurs, and that cleansing of our conscience. And I've known people that get hung up on this belief, and they end up getting kind of argumentative and uh, angry. And I think it's the cleansing of the conscience part that gets lost. And, and it saddens me to see that. But the other thing is, I think the main argument of that belief system is that um, if you have to confess anything, you're not saved, right? I think they'll argue that. But Jesus said, all sins and blasphemy will be forgiven men except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only sin that ultimately has to be dealt with to get into heaven. So they've missed the point that, um, you know, our everyday sins, God intends us to say, you're right, God. I agree with you. And the word confess means to agree with you. I agree with you about my sin, and I'm going to give it to you, and thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for cleansing me, and we move on. And so we're missing a very beautiful cleansing process daily if we walk with the Lord and don't do this. So, but, but anyway, I know that uh, system. If you wouldn't mind, turn to the very end. I'm going to open another little can of worms here. But uh, at chapter 5, verse 16, um, I think people that hung up on that belief system can clear it up in the same book. It's no surprise to me. I think the Lord cleared up this thinking. Notice what verse 16 says. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he'll give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. Their sin leading to death, I do not say that he should pray for that. You may go, what in the world is that? If you remember when we went through 1 John, some people believe a sin that leads to death is a sin so grievous God will take your life. I don't believe that. I think he's talking about sin... There's only one sin that leads to death, and that's a blasphemy against the Spirit. Reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I'm a sinner and need forgiveness. And so if a person looked at that, they'd realize, oh, wait a second. Those other sins that are not that blasphemy, spirit, that's not going to condemn me. Um, those I'm supposed to confess to the Lord. I'm supposed to bring to him and receive forgiveness. And so um, he intended for that. Um, the sin that leads to death... That's the one we need to get straight. That's a one-time thing. That's a one-time thing. The rest of it, yeah, we sin all the time. The sin not leading to, that's something he intended for us to keep bringing to him and asking for forgiveness. So anyway, to me, that helps clear it up. And uh, you know, it's interesting, just a fascinating thing to think about. Notice he said, there's a sin leading to death. Don't pray for that. I don't know if you ever thought about that. What he's really saying is, don't ask me to force someone into salvation. I won't do that to them. I'm not saying we pray for people to get saved. I pray for their conviction. But the actual act of saying, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, God won't force anyone. He said, don't pray for that. I won't headlock anybody and force them into the kingdom. So anyway, I hope that clarifies. But I've heard that. I've heard that. Right. Right. It's that practical process of sanctification why we have 1 John 1, 9. That's what I believe, yeah. So I don't know if it's the same guy, but there was that, that belief system became very popular in a man named Bob George many, many years ago. I don't know if he's still teaching it, but yeah. So any other questions? Yeah, to me, it's, um, you know, it can be hard for people to hear. But first off, there's nobody good. And we need to realize that, right? That's man's thinking. Oh, that person's good. You know, they lived a good life. No, the problem is we're comparing ourselves to our neighbor. 
but our neighbor is not the standard. Jesus is the standard. We're all woefully, Isaiah tells us that our, our righteousness, our very best is like filthy rags. So we realize we're really, really wicked. And then we realize God's Holy Spirit's been convicting us every day of our lives. He so loves us to get us to confess our sin, to receive his forgiveness. Basically, God said, I've done everything for you to bring you into my kingdom. I love you so much. I've been convicting you your whole life because I don't want you to go to hell. You've rejected my offer to go to heaven. I'm going to honor your request. So that's the sad part. He's so wanting them to come to heaven, but he will not force them. He's basically going to say, I'm going to honor your request that you want nothing to do with me. So it's not, it's, to me, I don't even think of it as him sending them there. He's just honoring their request to go there. And so, but he's heartbroken in doing it because he wants them saved. So, well, I think there's compassion in that if they want to hear it. So, this question, Tom. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I talk to God all the time yeah. during the day. And yeah. How do I fear him? And what, what kind of fear am I supposed to fear? I got it. Yeah, it's a good question. Randy, real quick, come on up because we're going to have communion right after I answer this question, Don. But, uh, you know, the, I, to me, just my simple way, I always go back to the same analogy. Um, not everybody had good parents, but if you had good parents, if you had a really loving dad who loved the Lord, um, you love him. But if he's a good disciplinarian, you had a reason to fear him too, right? Because if you knew your dad would do whatever he was going to do if you, dis- if you did something bad, you feared him. But you never stopped loving him. So there is the fear that he can set us, set us straight, he can discipline us, maybe even very strongly at times. But there's supposed to be this duality. There's supposed to be a legitimate fear of the Lord even though we know he loves us, even though we know he'll, he's forgiven us, even though we're not going to be in heaven forever, but to disobey him, to grieve him, there should be a fear there because he can call us out at any moment, and he will because he loves us. So there should be a fear there. And I, I think we just, the only reason we don't fear him is we don't, we, we don't see him in his fullness. If we saw him in his fullness, I think we'd all fall down like dead men like they do in Scripture until we get our new body. But anyway, that's the way I just go back to my simple mind. A good, loving father you'll fear and love because there's a disciplining side of his love as well. So we're going to celebrate communion. I hope that helped, Don. Um, We're going to celebrate communion. For those of you who are new, Wednesday nights we don't pass out the communion like we do on Sundays. So Randy is going to play a couple of songs for us. At your leisure, come up and just enjoy grabbing the elements Enjoy that between you and the Lord. Thank the Lord. It's a night to remember Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Tonight we've had amazing reminders of what Jesus has done for us. You have a lot to be thankful for. So during these songs, make your way up. Enjoy those during those songs and enjoy your time with the Lord. So let's worship him. Let's celebrate communion. a place mercy reigns never die and there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide and all the love of comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you 
Praise the Lord. If you didn't yet get to enjoy your communion, please feel free to stay in the room for a little while and enjoy just some quiet time with the Lord and thanking him for who he is. But let's stand together as we uh, close our service and just thank the Lord for our evening. So, Father, we again thank you for your goodness. Thank you tonight for these two psalms, Lord. Just sow them deep into our hearts and minds. And, Lord, we just want to be rejoicing, thankful, blessing you children of God. You are so amazing. And every day we get to wake up and remember the fullness of what you have done for us. And it should just return a heart of tremendous praise, tremendous gratitude, wanting to serve you and tell others about your greatness every day. So thank you for being so good. Jesus, thank you for being such an astonishing Savior. We love you and praise you today. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. So, Father, bless us tonight. Fill us with your spirit for what we have tonight and the rest of our week with you. And we ask all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless each of you.